Happy Halloween to all our eager listeners. Welcome to another chilling broadcast of the Spirit Radio on this wonderful date, All Souls Day, Hallowtide, the Feast of the Dead. This mischief night, bundle up by that fireplace, hold your loved ones closer and listen at Attentively, for once again your grim host is here to be guide and guardian through your ghoulish tales of terror and trickery once again. <sighs> Nothing gives me as much joy as this night, this night when the barriers beyond the unseen gates of the occult and the mysterious are weakened to near breaking, and all manner of ghostly goings on rise up to clutch at your ankles and make you tremble in terror. But of course that all counts on you, dear listeners, does it not? I am but a host, a voice calling out for those with stories to share to pick up their phones and dial our number to be heard loud and proud on this night, our night. And tonight, my voice is like a jack-o'-lantern in the dark. There is no need to wander by the dim light of hell's call tonight. No, no, not when I can be your guiding host, leading you through the murk and the mire to beckon you into sharing your stories with us. If you cannot share a story tonight, the night when people are wanting, begging, pleading to dance with demons and wraiths, well then... When can you? When will you share that moment that keeps you up at night and lingers in your back brain when you playfully whisper, there's no such thing, only to catch yourself and wonder, what if? Whispers in the dark are exactly what this next caller has on her mind. And her mind is a terrible thing to waste. Hello there, Cola. You are on the air with the Spirit Radio. The microphone is all yours. Back in, I want to say the old days, but this was pretty much my childhood. DVDs were just coming into their own. My parents still thought that they were just a fad that would come and go, just like the laser discs had. And people were still using that tried and tested classic, the VHS cassette. If you wanted to make a copy of family movies like I was doing, or if you wanted to record some special that was only broadcast once on TV, the VHS cassette was the way to do it. Of course nowadays, with digital media and all that, there's no need for them. The cost of owning and taking care of them is ridiculous, but there is still something about them that I like. I guess for nostalgia reasons. But this was not pleasant nostalgia. So, I was a teenager, thought myself as a bit of a technical wizard with these sort of things. Beta cassettes, VHS cassettes, I knew all about them. It was nothing special. You just read the instruction manual and you plug it all together. But I thought I was some sort of genius. Well, one of the things I was taught to do in my AV department was to duplicate tapes. Sometimes we just do it if we need to make a copy of a video to hand in for a project. And because I I was a pretty okay student, I got along with all the staff. They didn't mind if I did this for personal use for things like home movies. So we used to travel around a lot when I was a kid. And so rather than, I know it's probably going to sound a bit nerdy, but please bear with me, our home movies used to be on a smaller kind of cassette that would go in the VHS casing. And that's how we would watch them back. But sometimes we were a bit worried that we would damage the cassettes and that we'd lose all the memories forever. So I thought I'd make some copies. And that was fine. The AV teacher didn't really care. Obviously, he had to make sure we weren't copying tapes that were, you know, store-bought. But if we were goofing around as amateur filmmakers, if anything, it was only encouraged that he would allow us to use the equipment so we could get to know it better. Sorry for all the explanation, it's just, with technology nowadays, it's so easy. People take it for granted. It's kind of strange to think how things went weird back then, and how we caught something weird that maybe we wouldn't catch today. So, I was tidying up some of my uncle's stuff back in the house. One of the things my uncle had was a bunch of old cassettes. My uncle was kind of where I got my love for AV footage from. I was devastated when he passed away. 
he used to do these paranormal investigation things. This was when TV shows were really starting to delve into the occult. And sometimes you see everyday TV showing unexplained phenomena, investigations and things like that. So in my time with puberty and hormones and development, my uncle was doing these things that had really big influence on me. He passed away a few years ago, literally two or three years before we were rummaging through all his stuff. We moved a lot of the stuff into storage and I found a big box full of old cassettes. Now, I know that we had to duplicate all those family videos that I mentioned, so I thought I'd check out the videos to see what was on them. My uncle usually filmed his ghost stories and explorations. For the first few minutes of the video that I picked up, there would just be a fixed camera pointed somewhere and him sat there recording. Sometimes you'd get a bit of a clonk, that was about it. Nothing too out of the ordinary or spectacular. What we ended up getting were boxes and boxes with some VHS tapes that were still perfectly good to record over, but were just footage of old buildings and my uncle saying, if there is anyone known, please come forth. Really boring stuff that we didn't really want to keep, even if it was of my uncle. You know, we had filmed so many family moments with him, coming to parties, coming to my sister's christening for example, we wanted to keep them safe. Anyway, I put a little bit of tape over one of the corners. You can do that if you want to put something else over it. If you look at the bottom of VHS tape, there should be a little square, like a little dent in the plastic. If you put something like a piece of tape over that, it'll allow you to record over the cassette. If you look on a blank VHS, you'll notice that at the same spot there's usually a little tab. Well, if you snap that tab off, it means that you can't record over the VHS. It just doesn't let you do it. So, I taped over it. Ironic now that I think about it, you taped over it to tape over it. And I set about doing the long process of duplicating our family memories. It's a bit awkward, you know. You have to just let the film run, doing its own thing. Press play and record at the same time, and the film continues as it is. So, you put the two cassettes in, you have them running at the same time. You're usually able to figure out how long the tapes are, because it will be printed on it somewhere. Again, sorry for all the explanations. So, I put the tapes in, I set them off, and I went about my business. Came back. The tapes were duplicated. I did this for about seven or eight of our family movies and put them all in my bag. Well, once I got home, I said, hey, guess what? I've got all the family movies copied. My dad thought it was a great idea to have a movie night. I admit, I cringed. What was I supposed to think? Oh, great, you know, as much as I love doing these things, sitting down for several hours, just watching us doing goofy things as a family, is not exactly my idea of a good night. I treasure keeping memories, but I didn't really want to sit through a full night of them. But hey, I'd just done this work. Maybe if I get this over and done with, he wouldn't want to keep dragging it up. So, I put the video in and we pressed play. Everything started out fine. We went to some sort of holiday destination. I can't remember where it was. Very generic, like some of the others we've been on. Anyway, we watched the movie, and we thought we saw something. It was like a flicker beneath the film. And sure enough, I could hear my uncle's voice. I made a couple of us jump because my uncle never came on these trips with us. He would just go out and... Well, look, okay? He wasn't there with us. Sorry. I just got a bit emotional hearing him. He was there, but we knew he wasn't there. Until I realised it's probably just some of the old footage bleeding through. My father kind of laughed. My uncle recorded all of these ghost videos... And then there he is, a ghost himself on a video of our holiday. My dad just chuckled. He was a bit choked up after hearing the voice, but in a nice way. Like, I guess he'll always be with us. Only here's the thing. We keep watching the tape, and it's clear that the footage has bled through somehow. As we were going through these holiday resorts and holiday events, you can hear my uncle occasionally in a while saying, Is anyone there? Only, as it goes on, it starts to get a little bit freakier. Something replies to him on the video. I got a little bit closer. My family pretended as if they weren't seeing or hearing anything. Or maybe they were just caught up in the moments. Then the phone rang, and that brought the family night to a close, because my father had an important business call to take. But I took the video cassette and I raced to my room. I put it into play, because something about that footage was really freaking me out. It started back up. And we were sat in some kind of themed bar. My sister was crying, and we were giving her some ice cream to try and calm her down. 
and then I saw it. There was a figure on the tape. I was having to sit right on top of the TV to try and catch the outline as well as trying to adjust the contrast and the brightness to try and see the taped over a bit of video clearer. In the video, I can see my slightly faded uncle is sat right at the bottom of the staircase and there's a shadow behind him. I figured that maybe it was a silhouette from one of our videos. But no, this, this was a shadow being with hands flexing. They're reaching out. My uncle got up and he, he looked up in surprise and said hello. We walked through the shadow and as he walked through it I could see that it dispersed around him. Then as my uncle was walking upstairs, he's got his hands on his shoulders. It's being pulled up by my uncle with every step he took, like it was following him. I wasn't sure what I was seeing at this point. The tape cut back to our holiday and it changed location. It went crackly for a minute and in static I thought I could see something, or someone, stood in front of the camera. But then the next scene started back up and there we are, walking on the beach this time. It was a bright beach, I could barely see the image beneath it anymore. So I had to, have to screw around the contrast again to see if I could get a better focus. Something came around the staircase, like a twitching shadow man, stepping closer and closer towards the camera. It straightened up, his arms were hanging low by its side, but they were like jutting out at the wrists. It looked like a zombie. And as my uncle starts coming back down the stairs, it looked up towards him. My uncle walked through the shadow figure again and asked, is there anyone there? It's so bizarre watching my uncle walk around in a haunted house or some sort of old abandoned building when the footage overlaid on him is a sunny beach where we were building sandcastles and eating ice cream. I can see the shadow man's head just behind my uncle's and it's grinning, this toothless, boyless smile, its empty sockets wide, its mouth dauntingly twisted as it was getting wider still. His finger reached up and I saw it touch the back of my uncle's neck. My uncle turned back to the stairs. He was confused, but the face, it stayed there. It was looking at me. The footage went a bit crackly then. Our family vacation had changed location again, but the face was still there in the static. It was looking back at me. It looked straight at me. I don't know how I know that, because it had no eyes. There's nothing in the eye sockets. There's just nothing glaring back. I can't even remember what the next sequence was for the family vacation because I can see my uncle, he's setting up another filming location and every time he's doing this he sees something. He must see something. And there was the shadow figure and it's the weird shadow with the hands. I start seeing my uncle looking around in horror, he was stumbling around. Now my uncle towards the last few weeks of his life he hadn't wanted to visit he hadn't wanted to come over. When my father asked him, he said he always sounded like a bag of nerves. Like he was coming apart at the seams. Is this why? Did he see this footage? Did he know? Was he being followed? At the end of the tape, there was one more when our family had been recording some sort of outdoor concert. My dad had set up his tripod and just left it pointing at the stage. We weren't even there. Me, Mum and my sister had gone off to somewhere to let Dad just enjoy the concert. He just turned the camera on and started filming. But the thing is, my uncle was on that footage too, in his own home. And I see him asking, pleading, Is there somebody there? Please, can you answer me? And there were so many of those shadowy figures looming out of the darkness. So many hands. And the first one, the one almost imposed over my uncle's face in that film, is that socketless, eyeless, empty grinning figure with its face overlaying my uncle's and it started to mimic him, moving his lips in the same sequence as him. I stopped the tape with a clunk and a screech. It stopped and started to rewind itself. My throat felt really tight and my heart was racing. It was terrifying, absolutely terrifying. But the finale is somehow even worse. I put one more tape in, you know, just to see if it continued. There might be a chance it might have only been on that tape. And sure enough, there was nothing else there. So I thought I'd go through the rest of the videos, but just as get to the second to last one, not the last one like I almost expected. I got to the second to last one and part way through I start to hear it again. 
we were filming in some sort of swimming pool event. It was like a poolside party that was open for the resort. But it wasn't just swimming at the pool, there was cakes and decorations. I watched as in the footage, not beneath it, in the footage, I can see my uncle walking up to everyone saying, is there anybody there? My uncle would just stand and watch everyone walk past him. But you see, my uncle hadn't been on that trip. And why did his voice sound like he did when he was doing his investigations? Is there anyone there? Hey, can you see me? Is there anyone there? He was asking. And then, at the very last moment, I see him stop and sigh. And suddenly he looked up at the camera. On the film, my uncle looked like he was at least 50 or 60 feet away, surrounded by people. But this was a memory. This was my memory. This was one of my family's memories. And suddenly there was someone there who shouldn't be. And there is something there that shouldn't be. And in the space of less than a second, my uncle grinned. His eyes went black. His mouth went black too. And in a gibbering parody of his own voice, he lunged like full sprint. But his body didn't quite look right as he grabbed the camera and babbles over and over. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I stopped it out of sheer terror. It took a full 15 seconds to disappear. It had just frozen. And it kept grinning at me. So I told my parents that the tapes didn't work properly. And that I'd just make some more copies. Which I did. Nothing on those ones, but I'm still terrified. I know what you want to say. Why don't you just destroy the tapes? Well, I don't know if that thing has got my uncle in there with them. So I've just left them sitting at the bottom of my closet right now, gathering dust. And the reason why I'm calling in is it's likely that I've been hearing it asking me if I can hear it again. Can, can you hear, hear me? me? They used to believe in the days of old that the camera could capture a person's soul, trap it within that chemically created film and bind it tightly within its confines. But suppose it filmed something that only had a soul, hmm? What would happen, I wonder? Perhaps that caller just... I cannot wait to ask her what she saw, but that'll have to wait for a different time, far from here. Now, since our first caller did such a wonderful job of starting the ball rolling, let's keep the momentum and go straight into the next one. Hello, caller, and welcome to this Halloween edition of the Spirit Radio. I realize Halloween might not be for everyone, but you have a strange connection to it. I can't celebrate Halloween anymore now. Not since what happened to my uncle. My uncle was a pretty cool guy. He used to have his hair stuck up like a porcupine, always dyed in the funkiest of colours. I think the last one he had was a really deep purple that he had kinda bleached at the end so it went really really dark from his roots all the way out to light purple spikes at the end. It looked like lightning sometimes. You know, like that really deep plasma lightning? It was great. I try to remember the good things about him, like when he taught us how to make paper balloons that you heated and flew up into the air. Or when he would teach us how to fire a bow and arrow. He had like a whole list of weird and quirky talents that he'd picked up. He taught us how to make inquins. That was amazing. See, my uncle was kind of into the gothic stuff. Gothic, spooky, whatever you want to call it. I didn't think he was really bad into it. I mean, when you look up at an adult, they know what they're doing, right? And he was always kind around us. There were a few arguments sometimes about the kind of stuff he was talking about. Like he would tell us ghost stories and he would get really into detail and what used to really freak us out was how he could go to a book on the shelf and pick up a book and show us pictures. And he would tell us about witches in the witch trials and how they'd be burned. 
and he could point to the pictures. Well, I used to be too terrified to go to sleep or go near a candle, or even going to magic shows for being taught, thought of as a witch. That kind of annoyed my father, and he would get angry with his brother and tell him so repeatedly. Looking back at it, I guess he should have been a bit more careful around us kids, and I just wish he'd been careful with himself. It was one Halloween. He would always get so dressed up on Halloween, but he told us, he said, Look, I'm gonna play it really down low, okay? And he showed us his costume. My dad and my mum were actually thought it looked really cool. It was like this black cloak that he'd gotten, and he looked like a reaper. That was the kind of cloak that it was. This big, black, kind of velvety. It made him blend in with the darkness. It just absorbed all the light. All the time leading up to Halloween, he would show us the makeup. It was a bit unusual. Usually, he used to show up at the door and just jump out in whatever his costume was. But I guess he was introducing the costume to us slowly, so that we weren't scared of it as we were going to be. My uncle said that he was going to get out to a club with some of his friends, and then he would come back and we would walk with him and go trick-or-treating. He said to us, Alright kids, here is the deal. You start with your dad and go all the way up to my house. When you're here, I'll take you the rest of the way. Sound fair? Of course it did. We were kids. The more candy we've gotten, the more chance to hang out with our uncle. It was great. The day comes and my sister got this cute little princess costume on. But she wanted to be a vampire princess. So she was literally in the most Barbie girl-like princess outfit and has this big clunky plastic teeth in. And me? I wanted to be a zombie ninja. We were weird kids. Go figure. Look at who our uncle was. Anyway, he calls on my dad and he says, Your uncle might be a little bit, little bit later, so we'll have in an extra few minutes. Or we will just take our time going down there. We start to head out, check our little trick or treat bags, check our makeup. My dad took some photographs of us with the camera. The night is not gonna sound so scary when I describe it, but when we get there, trust me, it will make sense. We start walking down the street, and we've gone through two or three houses, and suddenly my sister points. Look, there is uncle! Sure enough, by the side of the road, in what it looked like to be a very dark cape, just like he promised, with the spooky looking face and the makeup art that he'd been doing, was what we thought was our uncle. Looks just like him. My dad smiled and he takes a step closer. But as he does, my uncle steps back and keeps walking backwards, out of sight. He never takes his eyes off of us. My dad, thinking nothing of it, just shrugs it off. Probably one of, just one of his pranks or something. He says, We had a cool uncle, okay? We always thought that was what he was about. The thing is, we go to a few more houses, and he's there. Again, on the other side of the road. Only this time, as soon as we see him, he's already walking backwards. My little sister waves and she looks a little bit upset. Now, this is twice that we had seen him, and twice he disappeared. Well, not disappeared, we could see him walking backwards. My dad gets over and tries to get quicker towards him, trying to catch him, but he's got to keep an eye on me and my sister. Third time this happens, he actively picks us both up and he starts storming towards him. But as he does, my uncle starts walking backwards and disappears out of sight in amongst a group of trees. By now my dad's been getting pretty pissed, so he takes off his phone and he calls up my uncle's house. There's no reply. He calls up again. Nothing. He calls back home. Oh yeah, sure, my mom answers. And she's tired. But nothing. We see him once more. This time, my dad decides he's had enough. He says, well, clearly, if your uncle is trying to be crossing this point, because there's clearly a limit. Once, twice, that third time jumping out and scare us, but this was the fourth time now, that he'd just done that weird disappearing act of his. He said, if your uncle wants to see you this much, you better go and see him now, and then you can get extra candy. How about that? I'll make sure he treats you 
I'm jumping from joy. Cause, admittedly, zombie ninjas don't get that much candy as cute vampire princesses. It seemed. Okay, fine. Store that for next year, I thought. So we get to my uncle's house and we can see him. He lives in an apartment building that has a chair set down at the bottom of the staircase and he's sat on it, with the rope on and everything. My dad has a key to get us through the front door. So we go in and I remember his voice. What do you think of the kids' costumes? He says cheerfully. He takes a step a little bit forward and... You can always tell when your parents are talking to each other compared to when they are talking for you. All bright and cheerful. Hey, what are you thinking about the kids' costumes? And then that tone shift of, Hey man, what's going on out there? But Edgar is a little bit closer, reaches out, and as he is putting his hand on my uncle's shoulder, my uncle just crumples and falls to the floor. My sister and I giggle, thinking he has fallen off his chair, but he doesn't get up. My dad's not smiling. Something's wrong. Something's really wrong. It all changes after that. Me and my sister were giggling at our silly uncle, but my dad turns him over and we see all of his carefully done makeup has been smushed from when he has hit the floor. That's the bit I remembered that brought me out of it. He's always up for a joke, but as long as things look spooky, that was the part of the trick fading away, I guess. The illusion, the spookiness of it all. Because he was dead. There was no joke behind it. My dad called for police officers. We didn't know if he suspected foul play medics. He tried to revive him. My dad had makeup on his own face when he tried to give him mouth to mouth. As my uncle was being wheeled away into the hospital and ambulance, I remember looking up at the street. And there were two of him. One with the hood up. The one we had seen all night. And one with smeared makeup and the saddest expression on his face as he turned and slowly walked away to go with the being that would not turn away from us, constantly staring at us as it walked backwards. I mentioned the camera earlier. And this comes into play now, because only a few weeks ago, my dad dug out a whole bunch of my uncle's stuff from the attic. He'd only had a small apartment. My uncle was really into the occult, like really into it. He had a journal, he would keep notes, just, I guess it was the only point of normalcy in his house. He got like poses of witches and warlocks and pagan symbols and all that kind of stuff that I didn't understand. Probably good stuff. Again, my uncle was no devil worshipper or anything crazy. You know he didn't do anything insane. But I guess he must have done something, because when we read his journal, we see all these happy entries. And then it starts to become delirious. I keep seeing it. I don't know what the heck I've done, but I keep seeing it. Early on, he mentions, I thought I saw it again. But whatever the heck it was, if it was just my hallucinations, I'm definitely gonna keep those. Maybe I should use it to scare the kids. Yeah. If I make some notes of it, there's a little sketch of the makeup designs that he used that night. I will always remember the last entry. It wants me. It's after me. Help! It looks so unlike his normal handwriting. Quivering. Ink dripped all over the page. Practically carved into the paper. Every night he left, he must have been so terrified to go back into that apartment. And as for the photographs that I told you about, when me and my sister had out photographs taken of our costumes before we even went out of the door, the tall, gaunt-looking silhouette of my uncle stood behind us. As I said at the start of this broadcast, the barriers between the land of the living and the deceased bend and buckle, and moments where a loved one lost can emerge from the shadows to greet you once again. You just have to be very careful, so very careful, that you don't get dragged back into that inky blackness with them. That is why I act as a beacon to you all lost souls out there, desperate to be heard, 
and to share your stories in frightful fragments with us. A beacon, a guide, an eager listener. Not the kind who orders and demands. Am I correct, caller? <laughs> Come now. It's all right. I know your tale is a very special one. Call it a bit of Halloween magic, if you will. You enjoy magic, don't you, Cola? We all have that one boss that gets under our skin. Everyone has to have at least one of them. And if you haven't, you're damn lucky. But they are the bosses that, no matter what you say, no matter what you do, or what they say or what they do, they can't stand you, and you can't stand them. Maybe it's the head boss, maybe it's just a manager, but when he comes in and takes a pretty okay job and turns it into a hell, you're either hoping that they get fired, hoping that they have to leave, or you're just looking through the job columns for somewhere else to work. Well, as luck would have it, that's what's happening to me. I work in a small accounting firm. It's a big building and we're all sectioned off into different areas. We ran out of offices, but we've been there for so long we're practically part of the fixtures. We've seen them all come and go. You know, Small-time gaming companies, uh, accountants, law firms, even a cryogenic sales. You know, that was a weird one, seeing these big vats and tanks being wheeled into the basement only for some old rich guy to just come in and buy them anyway. Just... You know, anywhere they needed office space. They came in, hired, that was it. High-level turnaround as well, but I'm getting off topic. The point was, we'd been an okay company. We'd been around for 30 years or so at this point. One day, the boss decides he's going to move into a new area that he always wanted to develop. He wanted to set up a new franchise. He wanted to get further out into the field. And with him getting on... He was going to hire someone new to take over, running the head office, which is where we were. I'm not going to say names, or at least I'm not going to say this guy's name, but he was one of the most cold-hearted people I have ever known. Cold-hearted, but hot-headed. It's the worst kind of combination you could have. You could have poured water down this guy's throat, and ice would have come out the other end. When you get one typo on one document, he will pull you up on it. You'd be stuck on coffee duty all week. Really, just making the coffee. You'd still get paid for your normal shift, but you would have to make yourself look busy. He would send you home if you didn't find something like cleaning, tidying, polishing the clock. Yeah. You would just become an errand boy, and we've all been there at least once. Well... Rather creepily, the ones who wouldn't have been there are usually the women who had the courage to wear something that made themselves look flattering for him. Then the unwanted attention would sort of creep in. Nothing you could get pulled up for, but enough that they would still keep covered up on a summer's day. And when they did that, they would usually land on his shit list. Well, we were all getting sick of it. I told my friends one night when we were out drinking... Just because I work in one of the most boring jobs in the world. At least it was boring to me now. It was tolerable before, but since this guy turned up, it just become crushingly dull. I usually just ignored it, but after three months of working with this guy, that was a breaking point. I told my friends as much. One of my friends ran a spook house. Another one was an actor, and the last one was a radio producer. All nice, exciting careers. And me? Well, I just had enough money to keep a roof over my head. That's why I wasn't moving out anytime soon. We were a quirky kind of bunch. Bit off the wall. We all met as goths when we were teenagers. All big, trench coat wearing nihilists. We had a grudge against the world, even though we had nothing to have a grudge about. Anyway, one of them pipes up and he says... If you really want to mess this guy up, just curse him. Get something really sick and hide it in the dash of his car or in the drawer of his desk. 
We laughed and just imagined him having something like our the Godfather dropped on his desk. But instead of finding a horse's head, you know, finds like a tiny chicken head sat there, just eyeballing him right back. Oh yeah, real intimidating. But the idea, it stuck with me. Oh God, did it stick with me. So I thought, okay, let's go for it. Let's curse the SOB. We went out, talking with a few of our old friends, and trying to look for something that would do the job. Something that we just thought, hey, you know what? This will really get him. But you can't exactly go on eBay and type in cursed object. Well, you can, but you won't exactly find what you want. That was until one of them, one day, I have no idea how the heck he got it, and I don't want to know. But he shows up. We all meet in town, and this guy, he comes up to us with a big dopey grin on his face. I've got it, mate. Got what? I said. I know what you're going to do. Really? And what's that? You want to curse this bugger, yeah? Of course I do. By that point, I half wanted to curse him. I half wanted to curse him out, at the very least. He was being a jerk, but... Yeah, we're talking about curses here. He takes out a paper bag from his coat. Inside there were several plastic bags wrapped around something. Something solid, like a pot. Something solid, like a pot. Then it clicked. That wasn't ceramic. That was bone. Dude, are, are, you t are you telling me that's a skull? I stammered as I looked down exactly at what was in the bag. I peeled back the plastic and looked inside. I nearly dropped the damn thing. Well, yeah, it's a skull. Of course it's a skull. We didn't know what the heck to do with it, and some of us were kind of freaking out. But he explained... I don't think it's a real skull. A friend of mine, he worked at the museum, and this skull apparently used to belong to it. They used it for the, like, the curve thing, you know, the precious studies. You know, where they feel all the lumps in your head. He meant phrenology, but I didn't want to stop him in mid-flow. Anyway, he says, it's been sitting around, and no one's bothered with it. We just thought it was a plastic one, so he kind of slightly sold it to me on the side. I told him I was going to use it in one of my projects, or I was going to give it to the spook house, or something like that. But nope. He just hands it over, and he just says, take care with it. That's all. He said it used to belong to a guy who died in the electric chair, and they kept it around to understand the criminal mind. Okay, great, but... What the heck am I supposed to do with it? I can't exactly have a police investigation running around me. You're not. Look, it's a fake skull, isn't it? It's a fake skull. You stick it in his desk, he opens it up, he sees it, has a panic attack or a freak out. He gets pissed off. And at least, if nothing else, you get a good laugh. If it's real, you know, we'll have one bloody annoying ghost following him around, wouldn't he? I mean... He can't exactly walk up to the fuzz with it, and if he does go to the police, he's still got some nasty spirit following him around. He had a point. So I stuck with the plan. One day the guy goes out, and I asked one of the secretaries if she would mind wearing something a little bit more attractive, and Semi explained what my plan was. I said I was going to stick something in his desk that was going to scare the hell out of him. Luckily she laughed, joked with me, and said, Fine, I need something just to crack the mood around here. So, while he was distracted by her wonderful typing, I slip into the bottom of his desk. It was like a big old bureau thing, one of those big deep desks with two shallow desks either side, one where you can keep your papers and pens and a safe, and the other side will have a computer on it. I stuck it in there, didn't think any more of it. That's when things got weird. All through the building over the next few weeks, we started getting reports of power cuts at weird times. 
Different places would have losses of temperature. Okay, I wasn't stupid. These were signs of a haunting. So whatever the heck it was, it was working. But it was working on the entire building, not just the boss. He comes into work one day, and he does look a little bit sick. He looks pale and unsteady, not his usual brash self at all. I asked him if he was sleeping enough. He yelled at me to get back to my work, so I figured he deserved this. Okay, so it was obviously working. Things started getting a little bit more weird then. The vending machines started dispensing drinks for no good reason. And even when people were putting money in them, they would deposit the wrong drinks, or they wouldn't deposit anything at all, no matter how much money was put in. We had at least seven vending machines swapped out, and they still kept doing the same thing. The janitors kept complaining about handprints being found all over the glass. Noisy footsteps echoing up and down the hall when there was only a handful of people working in the entire building. The secretary, who had been on my side and was helping me out, well, she quit after she said that she saw strange hands placed over her own while she was typing at the keyboard. I even got an encounter of my own. I was walking through the central corridor, Big, spacious thing. Just a big corridor that goes straight to the side of the building and drops on both sides. I was carrying a big stack of papers. And I was going to go over to the photocopier, get myself some coffee, and churn out these mundane documents. As soon as I get halfway over there, I see someone standing on the other side. This black silhouette of a man. But there's no way he could just be a silhouette. He was stood right in the middle of a brightly lit room. There was no way he should have been looking like that. It had to have been a man from the size and build, but there's no way he could have been in any sort of darkness. He didn't even leave a damn shadow there was that much light. No, he was the shadow. As soon as I blinked, a flurry of papers from the stack I was carrying in my hands blew up into my face, and when they settled, he vanished. I told my friends what was going on, and they couldn't help but laugh. <laughs> oh yeah, we were laughing at first, but trust me, this is where things took another turn. I get into work the next day, and as I'm showing up for my afternoon shift, I see the paramedics outside. What the hell? I run up into the building, and I see that they're not just anywhere. No, no, they are right in our offices. Oh, great. Please don't tell me someone's found it. Please don't tell me someone has found it. They're going to end up calling the cops. We're going to have to go through a whole routine of trying to figure out what the hell the big plastic skull is. Well, we once thought the skull was fake, but now we know how real it is. Once I get into the office, I see that hard-assed old boss being wheeled out in a gurney. I asked what the hell happened, why the members said that someone had attacked him. Someone had attacked him in his office and nearly choked him to death. This just got cranked all the way up to 11. It needed to stop. I ran into the desk, I pulled open the drawer. There was nothing there. No skull. Nothing. As they were loading him up into the ambulance, I sprint outside and I find him with a panic. Look, all right, yell at me all you want, I don't care, but did you find something in your desk? His eyes went wide. Softly he nodded. Where did you put it? What the heck did you do with it? In a pain, raspy breath, he wheezed. Why? I wanted to scare you, I said. I wanted to scare you. I thought... I didn't think it would get like this. Please, I asked him. I need to stop this. I saw the saddest thing in my life at that point. This man, this hard-ass that treated us all like jerks, I was willing to go so far in order to make him suffer, had tears in his eyes, and the saddest look of childlike fear on his features, 
as he realised it was something much bigger than he understood. Weakly, he choked out the words. I threw it in the trash compactor weeks ago. Why the heck didn't you say anything? I rasped at him. I figured it was someone's idea of a sick joke. So I threw it out. I, I never thought... He started to choke up at that point, and his breathing grew ragged, so the paramedics whisked him off as quickly as possible. He made it to the hospital, but two days later, nurses said that he'd had some sort of panic attack and died screaming fitfully in his sleep, his heart just given out. Since then, the hauntings have got worse. People have been getting claw marks on their bodies. I keep seeing things out of the corner of my eye. The head of the company showed up for three days just to get things in order after the death of the manager, but he didn't stay. I could tell he'd seen something he couldn't quite understand either. I was a jerk. I was wrong. I did the worst possible thing I could have done. And that guy, I feel, is dead because of me. Don't let the dead rule the living. I warn everyone who can listen to this. Do not let the dead rule the living. Curses can be such dangerous little things. Sure, you might get exactly what you think you want, but the costs are not written in ink. There are no refunds or redoing. And the costs are always far more than most can afford to pay. Be careful which doors you open, my dear listeners, for the doors to the beyond are not so easy to close. If they were, would tonight be full of such japes and jovial jokes? I think not, my dear listeners, I think not. But listen to me prattling on like this. This might be the show in which I am the gregarious host, but it is your time to be heard, and please do excuse my ignorance, dear caller. Ignorance is, after all, what led you to this dark and dreamy path that led us to your story, does it not? Hey, so <clears throat> a few years ago I used to live in an apartment in a large old converted house. It was about three stories Four stories tall, I guess. And it was rented by a nice, kind old man. I don't want to say his name because he has relatives who could still be affected by this story. I'd been staying there a few months. I moved in after the death of my parents. And I was working two jobs to try and make sure I was covering my own expenses. But he was a kind guy. And he would occasionally let me slip a week or two of rent if I'd been struggling. Because he knew he'd eventually get it back. Sometimes he'd even ask if I was free to do any odd jobs and he'd take some money off my rent. It was a pretty good arrangement, and he did that with most of the tenants. He was just so agreeable. Well, one day, I showed up to pay the rent. He'd always been a quiet man, and even though he would speak through the door, he never spoke much for himself, so it surprised me when a woman opened the door, and she looked at me. This slightly frail-looking woman with a smile on her lips, and a little cardigan draped around her shoulders. I asked her where the landlord was. She said he wasn't feeling very well, and she was his wife and if I wanted to, I could pay her. I questioned it at first, until she handed me a receipt, and I saw that all the paperwork was filled out expertly. She'd clearly done this a million and one times. I asked her how come I've never met her, and she said, Oh, my legs. You see, I can't move around as much as I used to. And sure enough, she did look pretty weak. I thought she was almost gaunt-looking, the, the way she appeared. Slightly sunken eyes... I didn't think she was older than my landlord. I thought she might even be as much as ten years younger, but the way she lived made her look older than she really was. <clears throat> so, I just shrugged it off. Everyone has these moments where they look older than they are. I started to notice the sound of cats meowing loudly outside that week. It got me confused, but for the next few weeks I didn't really question it. It would get so bad sometimes I'd have to swat them away by throwing something outside or and watching them all disperse. It wasn't just me. It was the other tenants. We were starting to worry there might be a rat problem. Anyway, I go down the next month to pay my rent and there's this kind of funny smell in the air. A smell I'd never smelt before, 
but before I could really question it, the lady came to the door, and once again the paperwork was all filled out. She was burning a few candles and smiling sweetly. A few more tenants showed up with their paperwork as well, and their money ready to hand over rent. She smiled and nodded and filled out the paperwork. They had requests, and she asked if there was anything they'd be able to help with with some of the problems that were arising around the house. Things like maintenance work and such. We all nodded and agreed. We didn't question anything at that point. Granted, there was still that unpleasant smell that she said was something to do with the drains, and that she was trying to get it sorted, but at one point it got so bad that one of the families downstairs had to move out. But I just believed her story, I didn't really think anything of it. We all complained about the stench, and she said that she, what she would do is talk to her husband, who was still ill in bed, and ask how he would handle it. She walked off and we waited outside. He said what he would do was let us all have our rent for free that month. That started a lot of us questioning things. Free rent for a month? How was he going to get by? Well, he was an old man, and because he was ill, I assumed he was on some kind of supportive income. I was a kid, so and I didn't really understand that well. I didn't really know things that well. I just thought maybe he had some kind of pension or something, because he was an older guy. When you're talking to older people, I was always taught to respect their privacy because of their nerves. You might end up upsetting them. And it's the same with anyone, you don't want to make them worse if their nerves are terrible. Anyway, we asked, well that's very well, but what what do you want us to do? And he said, well since you've not spent the money on rent, how about you pay for the plumber? And then all of you could pull your money together, and it would just be a small amount for each of you. And we couldn't really argue with that, I mean, we were saving a full month's rent, and then we'd only have to fork over, like, a small amount of money to pay for the plumber. And hopefully they'd be able to get the problem sorted. We called the plumber, but he never arrived. By now you're probably smarter than I am, and you've figured out what was going on, but I'm going to continue anyway. The plumber never showed up because the woman had cancelled. One day, the police came knocking on the door with the relatives of the old man. He hadn't called, and they'd assumed the worst. They assumed that maybe he'd passed away while he was sleeping, so they were going to check on someone they cared about. They sure as heck didn't expect anyone to answer the door. She tried to tell the police that she was his wife, but their children, or I thought they were their children, said their mother had passed away shortly after they were born. It was at this point they arrested the old woman. Turned out she'd actually come from a mental institute, and she'd come to visit her old apartment and found the old caretaker was still there living alone. So she'd wait until she'd fall he'd fallen asleep, she killed him, and she left him there. The police found his body heavily decayed and reeking. She'd gone around the entire room and sealed up the windows and doors so the smell wasn't able to just drift out. Instead, it was seeping into the walls, it was that bad. The candles were burning to try and get rid of the smell and to get rid of any dangerous gases that were coming from the body. I know it might sound comedic to some, but it's horrible when you think that this kind, sweet old man, and she just killed him. She took it as her little home and she was using our money to continue keeping herself there with food, and none of us knew. We'd all been so quick in assuming. We were all questioning, of course, and a lot of the police officers gave us incredulous looks of, well, why didn't you call us sooner if you suspected something? What could we do, huh? It's not like you often think that um, you're in the same building as a dead man and you never think the murderer's going to stick around. That's why the cats were meowing. They could smell something to try and eat. They could smell the dead flesh of my landlord. Most of us had our money returned, and due to the circumstances, we insisted on we look for other accommodations. Since I left there, it's been several years, and I've come back and see that someone else has bought the place. They've split it into offices, I think. Every night, what happened there, it still haunts me. Now I always make sure to talk to my landlord, and I know exactly who's coming and going from our apartment building. We all like to be left alone. Left to enjoy some peace and quiet to our own devices. But how vulnerable that makes us to those who wish to prey upon our isolation. Make sure, dear listeners, that while you may enjoy being alone, that you are never lonely. After all, here I am, a voice in the darkness, your guiding host here to keep all of you company on this wonderful Halloween night, to allow you in these quiet times to seize a moment of darkened peace, perhaps some quiet reflection. 
But I am getting ahead of myself. It's time for my next caller to take the microphone, is it not? Hello there, caller. You are live and loud here on the Spirit Radio. Share with us your story of shivers. I loved my grandfather. Don't get me wrong. He taught me a lot of good things in life. He taught me about starting a campfire out of just tree branches and striking a flint. He taught me the value of money. He taught me how to defend myself when I was bullied in school. But unfortunately, my greatest memory of him, the one that I remember the most, is the biggest lesson that I learned. And that's not to covet things. Not to be envious of other people. And don't go too far in trying to get what you want. I used to stay at my grandfather's house regularly. He and my grandma had divorced and she moved on, moved away, and was now living with another family on the other side of the country. Me and my big sister... We used to go, and he would do all these quirky things with us. He was a photographer and an antiques dealer. The photography was, you know, to keep the money coming in, so he could afford to deal with the antiques. And sometimes, when there was a quiet period, or if some new road show came out, there would always be some amateurs turning up to ooh and ah at all the stuff he had kept around the bottom of his house. Which he had laid out pretty much like a shop. Only the upstairs area was where he was happy. It was set up like a house up there. Anyways, there was one thing he always used to tell me. Out of his collection, there was one thing he wanted more than anything else in the world. A mirror. A very beautiful mirror that belonged to an old woman three houses away further up on the hill. One day he said, She won't go before I get the chance to grab that. I'll haggle it down from her. He'd always laugh. And I always used to believe that he would. One day he'd get it. Sometimes he would go to visit, because they would trade and deal. But I just thought that my grandfather liked the mirror. I didn't know how obsessed he was with it. That mirror was worth a small fortune, I later found out. The reason the old woman wouldn't get rid of it was because that her husband had restored it for her. He'd redone the paint, brought the varnish up to a nice shine, and polished the glass, and put it all back up to coat, so that it looked pristine and perfect, like the day it was made. My grandfather wanted it. He wanted it to own for his own collection, because he knew that it was worth a fortune. Sometimes he would, on his bad days, and he thought that my sister and I didn't notice, but... On the bad days, he would be almost angry and bitter whenever he would see her go past, and there would be a glare of only a few seconds. Because people admired her belongings, it would always sort of drift past, and once or twice my grandfather would be able to sell something from his home. But this little old lady, who merely collected over the years, would be able to definitely sell something. Anyway... One day, the old lady passed away, and no, I don't want to say that my grandfather had anything to do with this. I actually don't believe that, for starters. She was a very old woman with slowly failing health, and he knew that. He knew that because of the way she would start to be very, very reclusive and stay in her home, and very rarely come around anymore, and I would see him sometimes on the visits, eyeing the houses as if he was thinking... Once or twice I'd see him come back, late at night with boots covered up in dirt and his breathing rapid. From what I understand now, my guess is he was probably scouting around the house. Because, you see, one night my grandfather stumbled loudly back into the house. My sister and I were still asleep when he came back, so we woke up to him propping something covered in cloth in the corner of one of the rooms. 
Despite his eagerness and his twitchiness and the wry smile tugging at the corner of his mouth, he quietly and politely tugged us back to bed, kissed us on the forehead, and said goodnight. I always thought that was weird. The way that he was almost so robotic with it. We got the news the next day that the old lady had passed. She passed away peacefully in her sleep. No foul play was found and nothing was discovered in an autopsy. But it was when my grandfather showed me that same day the mirror in the room. What do you think, he said with a big smile on his face. I, I was confused. When did he get it? Did he haggle it down from her? Did she give it to him? When? It didn't make any sense to me. I was only a young kid, but even I was slowly starting to understand that this didn't seem right. My grandfather had snuck into her house. I guess he had been trying to maybe do some business with her, or maybe he had... I don't know. The point was, while she was laying there, in the house, already dead, my grandfather snuck in there picked up that mirror and walked out with it. Maybe he was going to try and make a deal with her one last time, but in fearing the worst, that she would pass away before he had the chance. Well, lo and behold, she did, but... He got his chance. I guess. You'd think that would be the end of it. And although my images of a grandfather who would not do any harm to anyone with only kindness and goodness in his heart, had been tarnished somewhat. It got worse for him later. A few weeks later, we came to visit my grandfather, and he had a cloth over the mirror. You could understand. This was the mirror that my grandfather had been desperate for, had offered so much, nothing neared the actual price of the item, but he had offered so many deals, trades, everything, to try and make some sort of deal with her. And she was accepting none of them, not a single one. So why was he covering up the thing he had spent so much time trying to get? I asked him about it. Asked if something was wrong, and he calmly said, No, there was just... The light used to hit it in such a way that it would spoil the look of the room. So I just like to keep it covered up so that it doesn't get dusty or dirty. Initially, I didn't question it. But then I started to because I'd find my grandfather covering up more mirrors in the house and looking more shaken than before. He started to drink heavily. He would be almost delirious, stumbling down the steps, and he would try to make his breakfast, and sometimes he would burn everything or just spill everything on the floor. He wasn't sleeping. And I knew why. Or at least, I know why now. I walked to the mirror one day. My grandfather was in a drunken, sleeping state. I walked up to the mirror, and I pulled the cloth off. And I looked straight at the mirror, and it all looked fine. Everything looked just fine and well and healthy and average, boring even, absolutely boring. To me, it was just a mirror. But then I saw something about its old height. And in the very darkness of the room, in the back, and I was so tiny, I thought. But behind me, like someone was almost stood at the entrance of the door, was a skull-like face, gaunt and thin and grinning grinning down at me with a sickening leer on its lips and sunken eyes and dark sockets and looked like a nightmarish corpse. It looked like she was trying to smile kindly at me. I made no effort to hide. I pissed myself in horror and I screamed and my grandfather came in. He saw the mirror and he saw me and he threw the blanket immediately back over it and stammered out, don't tell anyone, for God's sake, don't tell anyone. He led me out of the room and he sat me down, helped me clean up, told my sister that I had an accident. When she was gone, he told me that every time he was looking at the mirror, he was seeing it. 
mocking him, laughing at him. He said it was her, the old woman, judging him, tormenting him, making sure he never got a second's peace. He used to just see it in her mirror, so he covered it up. Then it was in every mirror, and then, more than every mirror, it was appearing in reflections of glass in the house, and that's why he started to cover things up that shone. The polished floor had become scuffed up. He got rid of anything shiny, reflective, metallic, chrome. He was scared to get rid of the mirror because he thought if he got rid of it, she'd never leave him. That maybe she'd stay. The stress was too much for my grandfather, and with his drinking, he became very ill. He was sent to the hospital for about three months, and eventually slipped away. He was staying up far too late, even with sleeping medication. He would try to resist it, hide it, or be secretive about it. I hope he's at peace now. The mirror wasn't passed on to me or my sister. My mother paid for some house cleaners to take care of it. I never knew what happened to it. And I hope I'll never see it again. Yes, I think that will do for tonight. Time to bring an end to this campfire tale collection for a while. Now, my dear listeners, believe me, I am more than capable of staying around tonight on this night, but alas, for once it is I who choose to call time for now. Do not worry. I will be back soon, very soon, I hope, to call out from the night's darkness stronger and longer than before. This is what you have given us on this most perfect of nights, and we thank you for that. But as a wise poet wrote, The woods are lovely, dark and deep, But I have promises to keep, And miles to go before I sleep. Just remember that night time is our time, And soon the microphone will be yours once more, And I, your grim host, will be ready, Eager, and waiting. <laughs>